glad you, you, you gave me this opportunity. A uh, little background. I had to go to Houston to pick up this 16-foot-long counter, and I borrowed my friend's 16-foot-long trailer to do it. And uh, my wife didn't really want to go. So, uh, you know, what kind of friend can you call to do that? So <clears throat> I asked a buddy of mine to go, and uh, we were all set to go last Monday. And uh, I'm waiting for him. He doesn't show up. Uh, he's probably running a little late. So because uh, I, I had texted him the night before, I said, hey, I'll see you tomorrow morning. He said, fine. And he's running late, so I give him a call. And he said, well, you said that. You said the, uh, the following Monday, not this Monday, <laughs> I checked my text. I had, the, I had the day wrong. But he didn't read the text I had sent him, and he had it wrong too. So he said, well, let me check with my wife, and uh, I'll see if I can go. Call me back. Good, you can go. Well, I don't like driving. I get tired. It's kind of like going to the supermarket, and, and I can be in the Walmart five minutes. I get tired. I can cut grass for four hours and not be that tired. But driving makes me tired. How long does it take to, to go to Houston? About six and a half hours? This trip took ten and a half hours because of a traffic jam. I drove the, the whole way straight. Usually if I'm driving with my wife, we trade off, and she does, you know, 60, 70, 80 percent of the driving. That guy, Greg Henry, okay? We talked the whole way. Ten and a half hours about everything under the sun and more. And it was awesome. It was just an awesome experience, and it made me kind of miss being here more often, but as he was saying, with the freedom that we have in Christ, which we can demonstrate towards each other, you don't have to be someplace to be loved, okay? There are people who aren't in Christ who are still loved. Think about it. We did, man. We got so much revelation talking, man. We talked about the glory of God and the love of God, and I think there were a couple different times where we both come to, like, tears almost just thinking about God and what God does to bring life to people and set them free from the bondage that's in the world, man. You start talking about that, man, and it'll overwhelm your heart. Um, so thanks for inviting me. What's that? <laughs> you see the age we live in, man. Every time you say anything, people, where's the recording? <laughs> They want that recording, man. <laughs> you can't ever say anything off the record anymore. Man, thank you, Father. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, that you're here with us, that you're in us, man, that your spirit is here to guide us into the truth. Just thank you, Lord, that uh, um, we can talk today about the, the new commandment and what it means to do righteousness. And, and we could find ourselves set free from captivity, and we can find our hearts set free, and we can find our hearts walking in the truth and, and just... Uh, feeling your love and, and feeling loved by you and, and abiding in your love for us. Thank you, Father. Amen. Glory to God. Um, we're going to talk about doing righteousness, but we're going to talk about so many different things. I don't even know if I should really say that that's what we're going to talk about. Um, but we just want to look at what it means to do, to, to do righteousness or what doing righteousness means so that we could actually understand what it is. I mean, what, is it, what does it even mean to do righteousness? And I think we all have our own ideas, but you know who also has an idea about what it means to do righteousness? God. Guess whose idea is the only idea that's the right idea? God. <laughs> so we want to look at what it means to do righteousness because I, I think most people actually want to do righteousness, but if we don't understand what it means to do righteousness, we can have a desire to do righteousness. We can actually have a zeal for God and a zeal to do righteousness. But if we don't understand what it means to do righteousness, we'll find ourselves walking after the flesh, and we won't even know how we found ourselves there. You know, we'll find ourselves walking after the flesh and we'll think, how did I even get here? Because my intent was not to walk after the flesh, but my intent was to do righteousness. So how is it that, that this could have happened? And I, I, when I look in the Bible, you, you find this kind of a thing go on with the Galatians and the Galatian church. The Galatian church had a desire to do righteousness. They wanted to do the good and the right thing. But their idea of what it meant to do righteousness involved performing the law of Moses. It involved thou shalt and thou shalt not. It involved touch not, taste not, 
handle not. Their idea of what it meant to do righteousness involved an outward action that they could get to manifest in their flesh. Their idea of what it meant to do righteousness was something they could get to manifest in their flesh. And so their idea of righteousness was, if we can be circumcised physically, then that's what it would mean to do righteousness. And then what Paul does is Paul comes along and says, listen, man, you may have a zeal for God. You guys may be well-intentioned and you want it to do righteousness. But really what you've done in doing this thing and thinking that doing righteousness is about getting something to manifest outwardly in your flesh or through your flesh is you're actually walking after the flesh now. And in walking after the flesh, he said, you've now come and made Christ of no effect in your life in this world. And I think a lot of Christians, we, we don't know how to relate to that, I guess, because we're, we're not busy toiling in our minds with being physically circumcised. You know, that's not like the big issue in the church. We're not busy, like, contemplating that. And so sometimes we think, what does that mean? But for us, if we define doing righteousness as getting the fruit of the Spirit to manifest in our lives, if that's what we define, as doing righteousness, as we must now get the fruit of the Spirit. We must now get love. We must now produce love. We must now produce kindness. We must now produce long-suffering. We must now produce joy. We must now produce peace. What that is, guys, is that's actually walking after the flesh. And what will happen is, is if that's how we define doing righteousness, we're going to end up with Christ as no effect in our lives while we walk through this world also. And what's a life where Christ has become of no effect in our lives? A life where Christ has become of no effect in our lives is where, man, we're not able to experience the peace, the love, and the joy of God in our hearts because we're busy trying to get it to manifest instead of resting in him to bring forth his fruit in us. So, guys, the life we live now in the flesh is not a life where we're busy trying to get the fruit of the Spirit to manifest in our lives. That's not the life we live now in the flesh. The life we live now in the flesh is one where we rest in God and His ability through Jesus to bring forth His fruit in us apart from our works. That's the life we now live in the flesh. That's why Paul said it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ living in me. What he's saying is, I'm no longer trying to do righteousness by bringing forth the right fruit, but now I find myself resting in the word of truth that was declared in Christ, and I find that truth dwelling in me, bringing forth fruit in me apart from my contribution, apart from my works. Glory to God. And so it's real important what we define as doing righteousness. And I think what we've done a bit is we've confused doing righteousness with the fruit of righteousness. If you can understand what I'm saying. What we've done is, there should a person actually do righteousness or do what God calls the good and the right thing, after they've already done that, what will happen is it will produce a certain kind of fruit. Now, what we've done is we've looked at the fruit that doing righteousness will actually produce, and we define the fruit as what it means to do righteousness. You see? And then we get it backwards. And when we get it backwards like that, it leaves us walking after the flesh. Well, we're all the time laboring and toiling trying to bring forth the right fruit. All the time wondering, where is the fruit we're supposed to have? Why isn't it there? And then if we think we're supposed to have it, and we think we're supposed to produce it, and then we think we don't have it, then we're left in the place where our souls are subverted. So I hope you guys can understand what I'm saying. There's a difference between doing righteousness and the fruit that comes forth after a person has already done it. Okay? There's a difference. And we don't want to confuse the fruit that comes forth from doing righteousness with doing righteousness itself. Because if we confuse those two things, it will lead to a life of walking after the flesh, just like the Galatians were walking after the flesh, and we'll end up with Christ as, as no effect in our lives as we walk through this earth. Um, hopefully you guys can understand what that means um, when I say that. Glory to God. So we're going to look at um, John. We're going to look at John's gospel, and we're going to look at John's letters. And... Um, Man, you guys will have to forgive me for not getting the verses up here on the, the screen, but um, I'll just read through them, and, and I'll, I'll have to start maybe doing a better job of getting them up on the screen. But we're going to go to 1 John chapter 3. So we can look at what it means to do righteousness. 1 John chapter 3, and we'll start with verse 6. 1 John chapter 3 verse 6 says it this way. Whosoever abideth in Jesus sins not. Whosoever sins hath not seen him, neither known him. 
Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as Jesus is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, whosoever abideth in Jesus sinneth not, he says. Um, And then he says right after that, uh, whosoever sinneth hath not seen him or known him. Now, what we haven't understood about that verse is we've kind of taken it backwards. And what we've done is we said, well, should a person have the works of the flesh manifesting in some area of their life, that must mean they don't have the Son. That must mean they're not saved. That must mean that they don't have eternal life. That must mean they're a sinner. But John isn't saying that a person, or he's not defining a person who sins there as a person who has the works of the flesh manifesting in his life. He defines a person who is sinning there as a person who has not abided in the Son. He's defining the person who sins there as a person who hasn't believed on Jesus for life. And so what he says is, is the person who has believed on Jesus for eternal life, he can't commit sin because he's defining doing sin and doing righteousness according to believing on Jesus. Okay? So what he says is, the righteous thing to do is to believe on Jesus. So if you've believed on Jesus for eternal life, then you can't commit sin. He's not saying the evidence that a person has believed on Jesus is that they'll never commit another work of the flesh again. And if they do, that means they must not be saved. That's not what he's saying there, guys. And what, what we've kind of functioned from is when we've thought of doing righteousness and committing sin, we've thought of it from the foundation of touch not, taste not, handle not. We've thought of it from the foundation of performing thou shalt and thou shalt not. But John comes and he talks about doing righteousness and committing sin from a completely different foundation. He comes and talks about doing righteousness and committing sin from the foundation of abiding in Jesus or not abiding in Jesus. He comes and talks about doing righteousness and committing sin from the foundation of has a person believed on Jesus for life or have they rejected Jesus for life? So to sin would be to reject Jesus for eternal life, okay? To do righteousness would be to believe on Jesus for eternal life. And that's how John boils the whole thing down. He boils it down to one thing. Have you believed on Jesus? Have you believed on the Son? Have you believed on the testimony that the Father has come and given to the world through His Son? If you have, that means you're abided in Him, and that means you can't sin. It means you haven't sinned. It means you haven't missed the mark, okay? But he says, he who has not seen the Son or known the Son, meaning he who has not believed on the testimony that the Father has given to the world through the Son, they have committed sin, okay? They've committed sin because they have missed the mark. They've committed sin because they are not partakers of eternal life, okay? That's what John's talking about there. You guys following that so far? So listen, God's will for everybody's life is that they not perish, but they have eternal life. That's God's will for everyone's life. His will is that they would not perish, but that they would have eternal life. Glory to God. Okay? So to sin, the word sin, guys, means to not be a partaker of. It means to miss the mark. God has a mark for your life. His mark for your life is that you be clothed in his glory, in his immortality, and that you live for him forever in a body that can't die and experience a life called love for all eternity. That's the mark he has for your life. That's God's will for your life, that you be clothed in his glory, in his immortality, that you have eternal life, okay? So the word sin, guys, it means to miss the mark. Or it means to not be a partaker of. So to sin in this instance would to not be a partaker of eternal life or to miss the mark of, the, of God's will for your life. That's what it would mean to sin. So to sin in this instance would be to not be the possessor of eternal life. Because God's will for your life, when we think of a commandment, we want to think of it more like this. What is God's will for your life? His will is that you not perish, but that you have eternal life. 
That's his desire for your life. That's the vision he has for your life. Now, sin or committing sin would to not be a partaker of his vision for your life. It would be to miss his vision for your life. It would be to miss the mark that he has for your life, which would be that you not perish, but that you live eternally with him in love in a body that can never die. So to sin would be to not have that. Now, the only way you can have that, the only way you can be saved from death and have eternal life and live with him forever in a glorified human body clothed in his glory and his immortality is to believe on his son. He who has the son has life. We could say it like this. He who has the son has hit God's vision for their life. Okay? And so if I have hit the mark that God has for my life by having the son and the son dwelling in me through the Holy Spirit, then that means I haven't sinned. (laughs) And it actually means I've done righteousness. So listen, guys. If you believed on the son for eternal life and you've forsaken your own works, to have eternal life. You've already done righteousness. Case closed. You are a doer of righteousness. And that means you haven't sinned. Okay? Glory to God. Is everybody following that? Man, so let us go through our lives in this world no more wondering if we're doing righteousness or not. If we believed on the Son, man, if, if the, the seed of the Son, if the testimony of the Son dwells in us through the Holy Spirit, that means we have the Son, we have the Spirit of life dwelling in us, and we've now partaken of the thing God's always desired for our life, so we've hit the mark, we can't sin, hallelujah. That's a foreign thought to the world because the world tends to think of committing sin and doing righteousness according to outward actions or touch not, taste not, handle not, or performing thou shalt or thou shalt not. So John's doing something profound here, and John does something profound in his whole gospel in all his letters. What John's coming and doing is he's coming and revealing that there's a new commandment. He's coming and saying to everyone, there's a new commandment whereby we judge whether we've done righteousness or whether we've committed sin. There's a new commandment by which we're going to look at to see if we've done righteousness or to see whether we've committed sin. It's not the old commandment. And what the problem is, is that we've defined doing righteousness according to touch not, taste not, handle not. According to performing thou shalt, thou shalt not. And that's one of the primary reasons that... uh, One of the primary reasons that we've thought of doing righteousness as touch not, taste not, handle not, are performing thou shalts and thou shalt nots, is because we've all thought of the the commandment of God as pertaining to the law of Moses. (laughs) See, we've all thought of the commandment of God as pertaining to the law of Moses as if the law of Moses was the commandment of God. So then we've looked at that thing, and we see that thing telling us touch not, taste not, handle not. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. And then we've been busy with that as if it's the commandment of God. And then we've judged ourselves of doing righteousness as if we followed that. And then we've judged ourselves as sinning if we haven't done that. Right? And John comes and says, listen, guys, there's a whole new thing going on. And this thing that's new ain't really new. It's old. Okay? It's new to you because you've been busy living from the carnal mind. And so you haven't actually seen what the commandment of God is. You've been living according to a commandment that isn't the commandment of God at all. And there's something new that God has come and declared to you. And this is the thing that we want to abide in. This is actually the saying of God. This is actually what we want to abide in. Okay? So he's come and he's revealing a new commandment. And now we'll go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. 1 John chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. Now, John says he's not writing to them a new commandment, but he's writing to them an old commandment. A commandment that's been from the beginning. And then right after that, he says, again, I'm writing to you a new commandment. Sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? Sounds like he's contradicting himself. So first he says, I'm not writing to you a new commandment, but it's an old commandment because it's that which has been from the beginning. And then he says, but I am writing to you a new commandment. So it's like, which is it, guys? 
I mean, is this guy schizophrenic? And so then we stumble over what these verses are saying because we can't understand the contradiction. But notice John says, this commandment I'm giving to you that isn't new, it's old, but it's new. It's that which has been from the beginning. Now, what is that which has been from the beginning? That which has been from the beginning, John doesn't leave us out there wondering what's been from the beginning. He tells us the first the first verse of his gospel, and he tells us the first verse of John, 1 John. He says, that which has been from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, which we have tasted, which we have touched of the word of life. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word was made flesh. So John comes talking about a new commandment. The reason why he calls it a new commandment isn't because it's actually new. It's actually existed from the beginning of time and even before time because it existed without time. It's that which is without beginning, and it's that which is without end. But prior to Jesus coming, mankind was carnal. We were sold under sin, and we looked on the commandment of God as if it was touch not, taste not, handle not, thou shalt, thou shalt not. We've lived as if that was the commandment of God. And John comes and says, listen, it's new to you because you've been busy thinking the commandment of God is, is in outperforming outward actions, but it's actually old because it's that commandment that has been from the beginning, even before God created anything, even before he even created man, even before he even brought forth man, even before there could be such a thing as man falling, even before anything, this commandment existed. Glory to God. That is the commandment I've come declaring to you, John says. Hallelujah, man. And so he comes to change the mind. He comes to get people's minds off of what they think the commandment is, and he comes to set their mind on what the actual commandment is. Because when you can see the commandment for what it actually is, that commandment is unto manifesting eternal life in people. And that's how you don't sin. That's how you don't miss the mark. That's how you don't miss God's vision for your life. The commandment of God doesn't come and demand that you perform something, but it actually comes and manifests life in you. Hallelujah, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> mm. Glory to God. So, guys, the commandment of God is unto life. Um, and when I say it's unto life, what I mean is, is it supplies life. It comes to manifest life in you. It comes to manifest eternal life in you. It comes to sting your heart with the word of eternal life and then also give birth to the fruit that comes forth should a person see that they are the possessors of eternal life. That's the, the commandment that John's talking about here. And if we want to say it the, the funniest way, we could say it like this. Because we, our, our vernacular or our understanding of words, when we think of commandment, we think of an order. To perform. We think of somebody ordering us. You know, like if I say I commanded my son to do something, we're all busy thinking that that is a directive given to do something. But John comes and describes the commandment of God in a different way. And if we want to look at it, we could look at it as the commandment being the word of God or the testimony of God. And so what we could do in in, in understanding this better or to get our, our minds and our hearts to think about this in a different way is we could insert the word commandment where John puts the word word in his gospel. And so we could say it like this. In the beginning was the commandment and the commandment was with God and the commandment was God and the commandment was made flesh and we beheld the commandment and the commandment that we beheld was the light that can bring forth life in people. That's how we could look at it and get a much better accurate um, depiction of what he's saying there. So the, the new commandment is the word of life that has been from the beginning that was made flesh in Jesus. The new commandment is the testimony of God concerning his son. And when we say the new commandment is the word of life, it's not the word of you must have life. It's the word of what God has done to come and give you life. The new commandment is God's testimony to you of how he's come and conquered the thing that was keeping you separated from eternal life and how he's come and done something to make you or to give you eternal life for a free gift. That's the word of life. The commandment of God is not about something you must perform. The commandment of God is about him telling you what he has performed to conquer your sin and your death and to give you eternal life life as a free gift. That's the commandment of God. It's a declaration of what he's 
done. It's not a declaration of what you must do. Now, what happens with this commandment, notice how the commandment manifests life. It doesn't demand life. So should a person actually hear what the commandment of God is? Should they actually hear the testimony of his son concerning the word of what he's done to give us life? What happens is, is that commandment will cause that guy to rest. And that guy will then rest apart from his own works. Listen, guys, even in grace for like the first eight years of my life, I was busy trying to bring forth my own rest. Even though I had a beginning or elementary understanding of no longer being under law, but uh, being under grace. I was still busy thinking, how can I get rest to manifest? What I didn't realize is that the commandment of God, should I actually behold it? It's going to make me rest. It's going to cause me to lie down. And uh, in fact, I won't even notice that I've lied down. I'll have gone on with life for a couple years, and then I'll realize, oh, man, I've been lying down for like two years now. How'd that happen? Oh, man, the commandment of God came and manifested rest in me. The commandment of God will manifest rest in you. The commandment of God will cause you to lie down. The commandment of God will fill your heart and your soul so full of abundance that you'll feel so content that you won't feel any lack or any need to go and try to add anything to yourself to make yourself acceptable. And then you'll lie down. Glory to God. That's how the commandment of God works. Do you see a different dynamic? It's his word. His word, he comes to speak to you in order to animate your life with his life. Not to come and say, you don't have life. Bring forth life, and then I'll call you son. That's how we've looked at it, right? The commandment of God is, these are the things you should do. Touch not, taste not, handle not. All the different things, right? These are the thou shalts and the thou shalt nots you should do. Now. If you can do enough of those and come to God with those things, if you have enough of those things, then he'll call you son. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. God first comes and calls you his children. He first comes and calls you his beloved children. And what he comes and says to you, he says, listen, because I love you so much, I've come to conquer your sin and death. Because I love you so much, I can't imagine eternity without you there with me. So because of that, because my desire for your life is that you have eternal life, because my desire for your life is that you walk with me for all eternity in this wonderful love fellowship where, we're, where, where I'm not scrutinizing you and you don't feel scrutinized, but you only feel loved by me and you find that love manifesting in you back towards me, because that's what I desire for you, I've come and I've conquered sin and death and I've come to promise you eternal life as a gift, as a gift. There's nothing you can do to get it. There's nothing you can do to bring it forth. There's nothing you can do to manifest life in yourself. Only I can manifest life in you. Here's what I've done to do that. That's the commandment. Hallelujah. Do you guys see why it would be new and yet old? (laughs) Because there's only always been one way you can have life. There's only always been one way you can have eternal life. That's through the spirit of the living God. The spirit of the living God is the spirit of grace. It's not the spirit of works. And so it's old in the sense that there's only one life. It's the life that can be had in the son. It's called eternal life. And that life is born from the spirit of grace. So it's old in that sense. It's new in the sense that when Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he planted a wisdom into the earth and he infected the world and the church in the world with the wisdom that said, uh, life can be found through your works. Life can be, like, I, I talk about this all the time, but in the area of money. We say life can be found in our finances by giving tithes. Right? That's not the commandment of God. You see, but that's what men think the commandment of God is. And so then man would define doing righteousness by whether or not you gave your tithe or not. And they would define sinning by whether or not you've given your tithe or not. You see, that's why people even say you've robbed God. Listen, man, how can you rob a guy that doesn't lack? Will we now say God lacks, and you're, you, you are able to take from his life? Listen, man, God does not lack. He has an incorruptible life. Whether you give him money or not, he's going to live forever in love, okay? He doesn't need your money to do what he's going to do. He's going to do what he does apart from anybody ever giving him any money. Glory to God. <laughs> you guys see that? Thank you, Jesus. So, guys, what happens is, is even today, even in grace, man, when I look out into the world, I, I mean, in grace... And it's not people, it's not people don't have a malicious intent. They're just going with what they best know. 
And so this isn't that they're off in the corner having a fire with the devil and they want to preach the devil's message. That's not what this, this is about. But nonetheless, let us walk into the truth, okay? Whether we have good intentions or not, let us leave the lies behind, okay? Because it's not about whether we have good intentions, man. It's about whether or not it's the truth. And so don't feel upset if our good intentions resulted in us preaching something that wasn't the truth. Let us leave the lie behind. So even, even today when I look out into the world and even in, in the grace message, we've continued to con- be confused about what the new commandment is. We continue to be confused. And just like we confuse doing righteousness with the fruit of righteousness, we've confused what the new commandment is with the fruit that that commandment will manifest in somebody's life should a person abide in it. And so should a person abide? in the testimony of God, what will start happening to that person is they'll find the word of life that God declared in Jesus animating them with love, okay? And so what we've done is we've looked at the fruit of love that the new commandment will bring forth in a person, and then we've defined the new commandment by the fruit itself. And so we say because the new commandment will bring forth love in a person, we look at the love it brings forth, and then we say the new commandment is to love. The new commandment is not to love, man. And in the day you think the new commandment is to love, and you're busy thinking you must now manifest love, you're committing sin because you can't manifest love through your own ability, nor can you manifest love by being told you should love. The only way you can find love manifesting in you is by God and his doing apart from your works. Hallelujah. And then, you know, I'll say that, and some people think, well, Brother Greg said we shouldn't love. No, I'm actually describing what will be unto love manifesting in us. That's what I'm describing. I'm not saying that we won't love. I'm saying the way we'll find love manifesting in us is by this new commandment. And the new commandment isn't you should love. The new commandment will produce love in you. Big difference, okay? Glory to God. So we'll look at some of these verses in John. And we'll go to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, John talks about this a lot. I talk about this a lot. This has changed my life when, when, when you think about this. The whole gospel of John is about the revelation of Jesus as the commandment of God. The whole gospel of John is the revelation of Jesus as the law of God. Jesus the whole time declares himself to be the light of the world. The, the, the Jewish people thought the law of Moses was the light of the world. They thought the Torah was the light of the world. They thought the law of Moses was the commandment of God. Jesus comes along and reveals himself to be the law of God. All throughout John's gospel. And so John comes in, in John chapter 13, verse 34, and this is Jesus talking. A new commandment I give unto you. That you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have love for one another. Okay, so, and you can see why people can get confused when they look at that. Um, Because it sounds like Jesus is saying, a new commandment I give you, that you should love one another. But when you look at that in the Greek, what it says there is a new commandment I'm going to give you in order that you can find yourselves loving one another. He's basically saying, listen, guys, right now, you don't possess the ability to love one another. And so I'm going to give you a teaching and instruction that should you hear that teaching and instruction, you'll find that manifesting love out of you towards one another. Okay? He's not telling them the new commandment is to love one another. He's saying, I'm going to give you a new commandment. That new commandment will animate your life with love, and then you'll find yourself loving one another, even as I have loved you. Now, notice Jesus says, as I have loved you. Jesus says, in order that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, Jesus, the as I have loved you is an important distinction. He's not saying, you see that I loved you? Now you go and love too. That's not what he's saying there. He's saying there's a manner in which love was born out of me towards you. There's a way in which the love of God manifested out of my life towards you. I've come to declare that thing to you in order that you can also find the same love that's manifesting out of me towards you being born in your hearts towards one another. There's a thing 
that can give birth to the love of God in you. You see this thing that I've now adhered to, this thing that I've abided in, it has given birth to love in me. I've come to tell you about this same thing that's given birth to love in me in order that it can also give birth to love in you so that in the same way that I was able to love you, you'll find yourselves loving one another. Jesus talked about this in John 15. He says, even as I kept the Father's commandment, and then that caused me to abide in love. So Jesus clearly creates a separation there. He talks about there's a testimony. There's the testimony of the Father. The Father came and gave me a testimony. The testimony the Father gave me is called the word of life. And as I found myself abiding in the word of life that the Father gave me, I found something dynamic happening. I found myself abiding in the love of God and I found it giving birth to love out of my heart towards all people. I found it giving birth to love out of my heart towards the world. Now I come to testify to you of this same testimony the Father gave to me, so that if you should abide in the same testimony I've abided in, you'll find yourself abiding in my love. Glory to God. And you'll find your life animated by the same life, the same love my life is animated by. And that's how you'll be able to love one another. You guys see that difference there? It's a huge distinction. You see, Paul said that no good thing dwells in the flesh. So you can't produce love through the flesh. Now, if I give you a commandment that you should love, that's drawing from your flesh. It's drawing from your self-effort to love. You can't love that way. It's impossible. Glory to God. Hey, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that God's come and promised. God's come and promised, listen, I'll bring forth love in you apart from your contribution. That means apart from any commandment to you that tells you you have to love, I'm going to bring forth love in you. Abide in my testimony. And we'll get into what the testimony is. And it's a beautiful thing. Glory to God. So what, what, what caused the love of God to be manifested in Jesus towards the world? How did this love manifest? When did it manifest? And what did it look like? Because when we could see the love of God manifesting out of Jesus towards the world, it really helps us to see what the Father's testimony was. So John chapter 15 Verse 9 and 10. John chapter 15, verse 9 and 10. It says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandment, ye shall abide in my love. Notice how he draws the distinction there. There's a commandment that if you should keep, meaning should you abide in this commandment I give you, you'll find yourself abiding in love. And so he talks about there's something that causes you to abide in love. So what he says is, if you keep my commandment, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandment and abide in his love. Okay, so what was the father's commandment? What was the father's commandment to Jesus? Can everybody agree that that's the thing that Jesus says brought forth love in him? That the father gave him a commandment, he abided in that commandment, and that's what gave birth to love in him. And so what is the Father's commandment? You know, like I said earlier, when we think of the commandment of God or the Father's commandment, we want to think about it from the foundation of the will of God. So there was a will that God had for Jesus' life. Jesus abided in that will, okay? That's how he kept the commandment. Now, as by abiding in the will of God, that animated his life with the love of God, or it caused the love of God to come pouring out of him towards the world. So what was the will of God? The will of God for Jesus' life was that his life would be born from the Spirit and not born from the flesh. His will for Jesus' life was that Jesus would find life in him instead of trying to find life through the strength of the flesh. Because in doing that, Jesus could then reconcile the world to God. He could reconcile reconcile all things to God if he believed on the spirit of God for life instead of believing on the flesh. God's desire for Jesus' life is that Jesus would be exceedingly fruitful. His desire for Jesus' life was that he would be the heir of the world. His desire for Jesus' life was that he would be clothed with glory and immortality and that he could be sat at the right hand of God. That was God's will for Jesus' life. Now how did Jesus or how can Jesus find those things happening? The only way he could find those things happening is if he believed on the spirit for life instead of believing on the flesh. And in believing on the spirit for life, he would find God bringing forth all those things in him. (laughs) And that's why in Gethsemane, when he's sweating blood, 
Father, your will be done, not mine. He's not talking about him and the Father having a different will because he said him and the Father are one. What happened in Gethsemane? Jesus was sweating blood. Why was he sweating blood? Because his flesh knew he was about to go offer himself on the cross. And his flesh was trying to tell him, you can't go offer yourself on the cross. We're going to die. Life is found in preserving this flesh. Life is found in preserving this body. But Jesus knew that the flesh had a will and the spirit has a will that's contrary to the flesh. He knew the father had a will that was contrary to what the flesh was trying to tell him. The flesh was trying to tell him his ability to have life was found in the flesh. The flesh was trying to tell him his ability to be the heir of the world was found in him preserving his own life. But he says the father has another will. The father's will is that he's going to come and give me all all these things all i'm gonna do is believe on him to do it through his spirit glory to god that's the will of the father that's the will of god hallelujah that's the testimony or the commandment god gave to jesus you guys following that so he came and told jesus about his love for him he said listen man i want to make you the heir of the world i want to make you exceedingly fruitful I want to clothe you in an immortal body that's clothed in my glory, a body that can never die. I want to seat you at my right hand. Because I love you, I want to do these things for you. Because of the beauty I behold in you, because when I look upon you, my face shines in adoration when I think of you, because you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, these are the things that I want to do for you. I promise you. And he says, listen. Don't be confused. Your ability to find all these things manifesting, your ability to find all these things coming to pass in your life is not of you or the strength of the flesh or what you see manifesting in your body or the life that you see you can have in this world, but your ability to see these things come to pass is found in me and my spirit and my promise and the word of life that I've promised you. That's your ability to find these things coming to pass. Now, what Jesus did is he kept the commandment he heard what the father said that his ability to find all those things coming to pass was not in him in his ability to clothe himself it was not in his ability to preserve his own life it was not in his ability to keep himself from coming down to, to keep himself from dying on the cross it was not in his ability to prove he was the son but that it was in the father's ability he kept the commandment he abided in what the father said about how that would give him life now listen you guys following that? I know this is a lot of stuff, man. You guys, you, I'm going to go back and listen many times, and I just encourage everybody else to go back and listen. But how did that bring forth love in Jesus? How did that now, that's the testimony that Jesus said he kept, that manifested love in him. So now we jump to how did that, or how did him abiding in that now manifest love in him? Okay, so now we'll jump down to John chapter 15, verse 13. John chapter 15, verse 13. Look what he says. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So John comes in and describes the love of God as being a person coming and laying down their life for their friends. So the love of God that manifested out of Jesus, or what John calls or describes that would be Jesus loving the world or loving all people, would be found in him laying down his life for the world. Now, how is it that Jesus found himself laying down his life for the whole world? How is it that he found himself resting on the cross and dying on the cross? The only way Jesus could die on the cross, the only way he could rest on the cross, even as he was dying, even as all sin and death was coming against him, the only way he could resist the temptation to clothe himself with immortality, the only way he could resist the temptation to preserve his own life is if he abided in the Father's testimony that the Father would do all those things for him. And because because he abided in the word of the Father, that the Father said, I'll do those things. Jesus said, I don't need to do it for myself. And because he said, I don't need to do it for myself, he allowed himself to die on the cross. It manifested the love of God out of him when he died on the cross. The only way he could die on the cross is if he believed the Father was the one who would make him fruitful. If he believed the Father was the one that would clothe him with life. If he believed the Father was the one that would make him the heir of the world. And because he abided in the Father's promise that the Father would do that, he said, I don't need to do it myself I'll just hang on this cross and die and when he died we all say that the cross was a demonstration of the love of God wasn't it 
Well, what strengthened Jesus to die on the cross? The word the Father gave him, told him, you don't have to preserve your own life. You don't have to clothe yourself with glory and immortality. You don't have to make yourself the heir of the world. I promise I'll do it for you. Just trust me. And Jesus did. And because he did, it resulted in his death on the cross, which was the manifestation of him loving the world. <laughs> you guys see that? Glory to God. Glory to God. <laughs> you see, if Jesus hadn't, if he hadn't abided in the Father's commandment or the Father's word, he would have tried to clothe himself. He would have tried to preserve his own life. He would have tried to prove he was the son. He would have tried to make himself the heir of the world. He would have tried to make himself exceedingly fruitful. Guys, that would have resulted in him coming down off the cross, and then the love of God couldn't have been manifested towards the world. Do you guys see how God manifested love out of Jesus towards the world? It wasn't by giving him a a commandment. It was by him coming and promising to do all these things for Jesus that Jesus knew he needed. And he rested in that unto his death on the cross. His death on the cross was the manifestation of him loving everyone. So as I love you, so shall you love one another. You see, the manner in which love was able to pour out of me towards you is the same manner in which you'll find love pouring out of you towards one another. So before we get to that, how can we be sure the commandment is not to love? You know, how can we be sure? And I'll hammer this because people, people will still think Greg said we shouldn't love. Listen, man, I find um, not myself loving people, but I find Christ in me loving a whole lot of people all the time. And so when I, when I talk about this, I'm talking about the way I find love manifesting in me towards people um, when I could never love people this way before. I never could love people like I love people now. So this isn't a word of how we won't love. This is a word of how we'll find ourselves loving, and we'll find ourselves loving people effortlessly instead of it being difficult. Instead of us thinking, well, man, that guy isn't really nice, but oh, glory to God, we got to love him, you know? <laughs> You'll find yourself beholding beauty in people. And because you see how beautiful they are, because you see how valuable their life is, you'll find yourself loving them effortlessly. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So how can we be sure the commandment is not to love? And this is how we want to look at it. Whatever way we want to define the commandment of God, it must be able to give eternal life. It must be able to give you the Holy Spirit. You must be able to be indwelled by the Holy Spirit by abiding in the commandment. Okay? The commandment of God is unto life. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of life. So whatever we want to say about the commandment of God, it must be able to indwell us with the Holy Spirit, and it must be able to give us eternal life. Now, how many of us think that if we go out and love people, that's going to bring us out of the grave? How many people think your ability to love is now going to bring you out of the grave? How many people think your ability to love is now going to clothe you with glory and immortality? How many of you think you can have eternal life by your ability to love people? Because if you can have eternal life by your ability to love people, we don't need Jesus. God can just come and tell us to love. And then those who could love right would have eternal life. But no, God says the only way you can have eternal life is to abide in the Son. Well, if the only way we can have eternal life is to abide in the Son, how can we now say that the commandment is that we should love? The commandment is unto love manifesting. It is not commanding to love. So, Unless we can say, guys, that we can receive the Holy Spirit and be indwelled by the Holy Spirit through our ability to love, then neither can we say the commandment of God is that we should love. And you know what? It's actually in the Bible. My goodness, man. It's like the Holy Spirit knew of all this confusion that would come, and he actually puts all this stuff in the same chapters all around each other. My goodness. If we actually read it, we might see it. Hallelujah. And so look what John says in chapter 14. Verse 15, 16, and 17. If you love me, keep my commandment. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he shall abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So Jesus clearly says that if you abide in the commandment, the result will be you'll be indwelled with the Holy Spirit. So however we want to define the commandment that Jesus is talking about, it must be able to fill us with the Holy Spirit. How many of you think you can be filled with the Holy Spirit by your ability to love? How many of you were baptized in the Holy Spirit by your ability to love? (laughs) 
Because Jesus just said, if you abide in his commandment, the result will be is the comforter will come and dwell in you, even the spirit of truth. The new commandment is to believe on Jesus, period. And that's how the Holy Spirit indwells you. Glory to God. There's only one way a person can be filled with the Holy Spirit. We cannot receive the Holy Spirit by loving one another. It's the Spirit of the Son. The only way we can receive the Spirit of the Son is by believing on the Father's testimony to us through the Son. That's the only way it can happen, guys. Glory to God. Glory to God. That's how we can know the commandment is not to love, but it's to abide in the word God has spoken to us through Jesus. Okay, so back to what it means to abide in Jesus. 1 John, chapter 5. I mean, I encourage everybody to read John's gospel. Read it slow. Maybe even hang out in the first chapter for like a month and just read it. And then get to his letters and, 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 and just read it and, and see everything that's going on there. 1 John, chapter 5, beginning with verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God gave of his Son. We could say it this way. In